Oh, this is very common. And this is the method that Terence pioneered. Can we have focus again? And is uh, the, the jar technique, the mason jar technique. Now, I'm sure still to this day, executives at the Ball and Kerr Corporation <laughs> are wondering why sales were so strong in the 70s and 80s. Because these philosophy convinces cultivators would order like a thousand cases at a time, you know? <laughs> and that, that's really passe. The, the cultivation of psilocybin mushrooms has really been kind of a bubble, you know? It's really moved, uh, moved uh, past the present, the present generation. Um, there's some of it going on, but it's really way less than 10% of what it was in the, in the 70s and 80s, I believe. And there, this is a beautiful mushroom. And it's got a partial veil right here that tears and forms a ring. It's got a purple-brown spore print, bruises bluish. It's a very, very uh, pretty mushroom. The mushroom that the, the uh, uh, Native America, the, the, the Native Central Americans, uh, the Mesoamericans, uh, held in highest esteem was this mushroom. Psilocybe Mexicana. And Psilocybe Mexicana is kind of a um, tropical liberty cap. It's like Psilocybe semilanxieta that grows here, grows in the Northwest. And it's got a translucent striate uh, uh, cap. And it also is hygrophonous. It, it fades when it dries, and so it changes in its color, and it becomes opaque, and no longer can you see the gills uh, through the cap. Psilocybe Mexicana uh, forms sclerotia. I won't get into that right now, but this is a... Uh, good advertisement for corningware. <laughs> um, but you can grow this mushroom. It's very easy to grow. And, and when I grew this, you know, this is all at the Evergreen State College, I, I really had this sense that it was like God came down and touched every mushroom. <laughs> Sunburst. <laughs> I really had this impression that I was dealing with something that was noble. And Tea Nanakato, which this mushroom was known as, uh, but by the Mesoamericans, it literally translates uh, as a flesh of the gods. It is a mushroom that invokes godhead. Um, this, the mushroom that Steve uh, found with Gary Linkoff in Florida, they were at a mycological conference, a kind of a fuddy-duddy taxonomic conference, and they were bored out of their tears, and Steve Pollock and Gary Linkoff, Gary Linkoff wrote the Audubon Field Guide to Mushrooms, and, and Gary had a fascination for this, but he was kind of a closet, uh, you know, he was kind of uh, suppressing his, his interest to a large degree because they wanted to look respectable. And so he and Steve got bored of this conference. They said, well, let's get out of here. So there's in Tampa, Florida. They, they left. They jumped over a fence. Steve went into a sand dune, found one mushroom, put it into his mushroom basket, went back home. And they la noticed later on it was bruising bluish. Wow, this mushroom's bruising bluish. The psilocybin active mushroom species oftentimes bruise bluish. And so from that one specimen, Steve generated some cultures, grew up uh, what turned out to be isotypes, uh, uh, other holotypes, other mushrooms that, that from the same uh, original culture. And so he published it as a new species, Psilocybe tamponensis. And this is kind of how these mushrooms work. They seem to like choose people, you know, uh, to bring them into the foreground. So um, Dusty, my fiance, and, uh, uh, was, was, uh, we were driving down to um, Oregon along the coast of, we're driving through Washington and going down to Oregon. And thus he goes, you know, Paul, I've never collected liberty caps. I always wanted to collect liberty caps. I've heard about them. And I said, really? And he said, well, this is easy. So upon those words, I put on the brakes, pulled off to the side of the road. We climbed through the fence, and we immediately found liberty caps. You know, it was like, oh, you want liberty caps? No problem. Here they are, you know. <laughs> Here's Psilocybe semilanciata. So these species grow in France, they grow in Switzerland, they grow in Germany. They grow throughout the, the uh, they've been reported as far south as Arcata, probably down the Mendocino area. Um, and they're very, very common in Washington and Oregon. Uh, because the field of vision is so obvious, it's uh, a little bit more difficult to collect them now because everybody knows what you're doing. <laughs> if you're, you're collecting out in the field, there'll be people driving around on the road, they'll be honking their horns going, yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> Or it'd be farmers pulling up with their shotgun going, what the hell are you doing, you know? <laughs> so um, anyhow, the liberty caps are very, uh, can be very prolific. There's about 50 or 60 of them here. A Psilocybe semilanciata. And um, it's a very pretty mushroom, translucent striate. It's got a white a band along the gills. And in a few minutes here, I'll start giving you some taxonomic features uh, for identifying these mushrooms. But liberty caps are called liberty caps because of the French Revolution. They had this cap that looked like a, that similar in shape. Uh, but they also grow in Chile, you know, in southern Chile. 
So this mushroom is also around the world, grows in the Squally uh, uh, River area. The question is, you know, where did these mushrooms come from? Had they, were they exported from Europe, from the, from the Europeans coming over to the Americas, or would have they been resident here all along? Those are questions we don't have good answers for. So it tends to have a long, long stem. It's called laginiform because it bends back and forth. And this mushroom does not usually bruise bluish. So I'm going to give you a few features here. But the species that do not bruise bluish typically are more difficult to identify with the exception of Psilocybe semilanceata. Psilocybe semilanceata has purple brown spores, as do all the species in the genus Psilocybe. Spore print is a primary taxonomic feature in mushroom identification. And this is why the first thing that people will ask you if you call up a mycologist and you say, I found a mushroom, has gills, they're going to ask you what spore color is it. Spore color is always not reflective in the gills as, as in the, the deposit. The gills are oftentimes lighter in color, but the spore deposit in mass will give you the true color. The orangey spored species, some of them can be deadly poisonous. You know, the purple brown spored species, very, very few of them have, uh, have, are poisonous at all. And there's none that are deadly poisonous. But let me give you a few more parameters before you, you uh, bank on that. The temperate species of psilocybe, that is the ones that grow here in, in, in Golden Gate Park and going up to, into Washington, British Columbia, have a separable gelatinous pellicle. This is a pellicle that can be peeled, a skin. It's a translucent uh, skin that you can actually peel off the mushroom when the mushroom is fresh. Repeated drying and, and moisture and drying again will erode the pellicle and it won't be separable. But this is a feature that's very easy to see. And it's, uh, that is specific to this group and to some other mushrooms. But then I'll give you the parameters here in just a second. This is a species that I, I published called Psilocybe liniformans. Psilocybe liniformans is now on the red list of extinction in Europe. 50% of the mycorrhizal mushrooms in Europe appear to have become extinct in the past 30 years. And many of these saprophytic species are becoming extinct. So we have it still in Washington State. It has not been found in Europe now for 20 years. And this is not good news. But Psilocybe liniformans is also a psilocybin active mushroom. When I was uh, in Oxford at Christ Church, uh, this is the wall where Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. <laughs> and Lewis Carroll wrote a, 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 uh, an ode to, uh, to Alice who is a proctor's daughter. And Alice in Wonderland, this is exactly where it occurred, and this is where I collected Psilocybe semilanceata. <laughs> there is a connection here. <laughs> so another mushroom is called Psilocybe, uh, Psilocybe strictipes. This is all in this little semilanceata mexicana group that I'm showing you. These are grassland species that are long, long stemmed. Hygrophonous, separable gelatinous pellicle. Doesn't bruise bluish mush. There you can see the hygrophanity of the cap, white stemmed. And this is the separable gelatinous pellicle that I showed you earlier that you can peel off. And there's another example of it. Uh, Psilocybe uh, strictipes has been couched, I'll go back, has been couched in a lot of confusion because of a mixed collection that was collected in 1957. And the, a huge controversy occurred in this country which really uh, politicized and polarized uh, the mushroom uh, taxonomist. Because Roger M. and, uh, and uh, R. Gordon Wasson spent 20 or 30 years in Mexico identifying new species of mushrooms. And Roger M., who worked in Paris, they published a two-volume set, a monograph on the psilocybin mushrooms of Mexico, it was used by the Indians there, called Les, P Les Champignons Hallucinogen du Mexique. And in that monograph, they propose many new names. In the field of mycology, there is no greater honor than to give a friend or an expert and, uh, by naming a mushroom after them. So Roger M. published Psilocybe Wassonii to honor R. Gordon Wasson for his lifetime work. Well, before the monograph was published, Rolf Singer, who was at the Chicago Field Museum, contacted uh, 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 Alexander Smith, uh, and then they contacted R. Gordon Wasson and Roger M., and they gave them some of their contacts in southern Mexico. They went to uh, 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 
uh, Rolf Singer goes down to southern Mexico, makes collections, comes back. Unbeknownst to Roger M. and R. Gordon Wasson, they produce a monograph that's published in Mycologia, 1957-1958, that appeared four weeks before Les Champagnes de Lucien du Mexique was published, and as a result, usurped the names. Beat them to the punch. In the field of academia, this is traitorous activity. This is stealing somebody else's knowledge. Now, I knew Alexander Smith very, very well, and I talked to him you know, several times about this very subject. He claims that he would, did not know, that he did not know that these species were coming out in this, in this other uh, monograph, and had he known, he would not have gone ahead and been a co-author of these species. Because of that, it caused literally a rift between the, the French and European mycologists and the American mycologists, which, per, which survived this rift, this in, in antipathy survived even to this day. There are still wounds that have not been healed. And so because of that, many of the names, the, the lifelong work of Roger M. and R. Gordon Wasson now has become a footnote in the taxonomic literature because their monograph is not, is, is, did not take precedence in the names. So another mushroom, this is uh, David Aurora, and this is uh, Psilocybe pelliculosa. And David came up to Olympia and he goes, Paul, I want to photograph Psilocybe pelliculosa. Well, where can I find some? I go, oh, good question. I haven't even looked for it for four or five years. Uh, well, let's go to a place that has a new construction, about two years old. So we end up going to the Native American Spiritual Center at the Evergreen State College, the longhouse that was just built. Uh, and sure enough, two years later, boom, Psilocybe pelliculosa is growing at the longhouse. And so very easy to find these mushrooms once you set your mind to it. Psilocybe pelliculosa is a beautiful, beautiful mushroom. It's probably, well, I know for sure it's the only native species to the Northwest that's undeniably native. There's, it doesn't occur elsewhere in the world, with one or two exceptions now, but for, it's predominantly here in the, in, the, in the Northwest. It's a woodland species. It loves trails. So in November, especially in, in habitats that are being recovered by alder trees and whatnot, this mushroom is very, very, uh, very prolific. And it's, a, it's a, those environments that are being recaptured by nature, and it tends to grow. And a, it also grows next to a deadly poisonous mushroom called Gallerina atomalis. This is a psychoactive species, psilocybin active, Psilocybe pelliculosa. This is Gallerina atomalis that grow in the same habitat. A deadly poisonous species right next to a psychoactive mushroom. And then Psilocybe sylvatica. Now, this is the stories that, that, that empower me spiritually. I was a starving student living in an A-frame at the end of this Oyster Bay Road. I had no car. I had no money. Um, Jeff Chilton, who worked at Ostrom's Mushroom Farm, would bring me flats of shiitake. I was so grateful because I was so hungry and I was so poor. And I was sitting, you know, in this little place, and it was November, and it was raining, and it was cold, and, you know, and I when just felt suddenly inspired. It was like 11 o'clock at night, and I just stood up. And I thought, I'm going to go outside and go for a walk. And I walk outside, and I walk down this logging road, no moon, no flashlight, and I stop. And I bend down, and I put my hand on top of this mushroom. As soon as I touched it in the darkness, chills and electricity went through my arm. And I realized, oh my god, this feels like a psilocybe. <laughs> <laughs> and I was totally blind. And so I took out a piece of paper out of my wallet, and I threw it on the ground to mark the spot. And the next morning, I eagerly went there, and I found the only collection of Psilocybe sylvatica reported from the Northwest in the past 20 years. And experiences like that with, us, with those of us who have been, quote, unquote, chosen, or they're messengers, or, or empowered, these are common experiences. These are not unusual stories. These are things that push the limits of probability and, and, of, and believability but they're true. So where do you find the psilocybin active mushroom species in the Northwest? You find them at institutes of higher learning. <laughs> you find them at colleges. You find them around police stations, around courthouses, around you know, uh, anywhere there's, there, there is landscaping of government buildings. These mushrooms are centralized around government offices. <laughs> and so if you want to find mushrooms in the Northwest, still time active mushrooms, you know, visit the local county courthouse. You know, they're growing in a, the biggest patch of Slosby sign essence I've ever seen still grows to this day around the Thurston County Jail. You know, and I wonder about that because I was called in as an expert witness. All these kids were getting busted for psilocybin mushrooms. 
And I thought to myself, this is crazy. They're bringing in 50 of these people, quote unquote, trespassing for psilocybin mushroom collecting. And the government has no idea. By bringing these people into a courtroom, you've now uh, spoilated the judge, the bailiff, the, police, the, the policeman, the sheriff. They're all become you know, these unknown you know, uh, allies to the mushroom cause and spreading spore mass. It's absolutely true. Absolutely true. When you get in contact with somebody who's collecting these psilocybin mushrooms, they are a disease vector, in a sense, for spreading these mushrooms to neo-fascist Republican environments. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> um, I promise you, I, I defend some people. So, um, so this is philosophy. This is philosophy of student CI, and it produces a partial veil, and it bruises bluish. And this is another example of philosophy of student CI. It has a partial veil; it becomes a ring. It's got purple-brown spores from gills that are dark brown. It's got a separable gelatinous pellicle that you could peel off. It's got a translucent stripe margin. There's the veil; it pulls into a ring. Now, there's another mushroom. This one which is deadly poisonous, Gallerina atomnalis. And the reason why I wrote my first book was an issue of public safety. People were collecting this mushroom thinking it was psychoactive, and I predicted people would die from it. A woman, a girl, 16 years old, up by Whidbey Island about 10 years ago, did die from it. Why did she die? She went out into the into fields. Where it, this was on the border of a woods and a grassland. They were picking lots of Slosophy stuncii in that environment. They collected Gallerina atomnalis. They were not good at mushroom identification. They ate the mushrooms. They start getting sick. But the reputation in that area was don't go to the hospital. The doctors there you know, hate these psilocybin mushroom hunters. And they're going to do all these bad things to you. They're not trustworthy. Because the doctors were quoted even in the papers that these mushrooms are dangerous and these kids should be punished for this. So, and what happens is the kids would go into the hospital. They're high as a kite. They're getting a tube going down their stomach. They're getting a, tum a stomach pumped. And then they call in the local law enforcement. And under those conditions of being high and being under this medical emergency situation, they arrest them. They charge them with the, con with the possession of an illegal substance. So she knew this. Her friends knew this. They didn't go to the hospital. They waited 48 hours. The cyclopeptides that are present in Galeran Adonalis you know, uh, caused her to die. So she died because of this fear of a reprisal from the authorities, which is very unfortunate. This is Stephen Pollock, and this is what I call the ring of death. This is a gallery of Adam Nallis. There's probably enough mushrooms here to kill 10 people. It takes about 20 to 40 of these mushrooms. They grow right here in Golden Gate Park. You have specimens of gallery of Adam Nallis out on the display table. It is the number one threat uh, for amateurs collecting these mushrooms to be confused uh, for a psilocybin active mushroom species. So gallery of Adam Nallis has rusty brown spores. It also has a separable gelatinous pellicle, so that doesn't really help you. But the spore print is rusty brown. They're orange, more orange in color. So you really have to know what you're doing. Here's a photograph that I took at the Evergreen State College. Psilocybe stuncii growing right beside Gallerina adamnalis, so close the mushrooms are touching. And this is Gallerina adamnalis, purple, uh, has a rusty brown spore print. The stuncii has a purple brown spore print. A very good place to find these mushrooms also is rhododendron gardens. And this is, a, this is about 100 mushrooms here going under the rhododendron. This is at the Rhododendron Species uh, Foundation in Tacoma, Washington. Come to Washington, Oregon in October, November, find an azalea or rhododendron garden. They grow all over the place. They're extremely easy to find. Two years ago at the Mycological Society of San Francisco, when I gave a talk on psilocybin mushrooms, they went on a foray 200 feet out of the building. They ran into a huge patch of psilocybe cyanescence. I mean, it grow, these grow all over the place. It's very, very common. This is a species that I published called psilocybe cyanofribulosa. Cyanofribulosa because it's bluish on the stem. And there's been reports now this year of it showing up here. And two years ago, we saw some other specimens. So Sinofribulosa also grows here down in California. That's, that's new news to me as of two years ago. Um, and it also has a purple brown spore print, a separable gelatinous pellicle, and it bruises bluish. It also has forked chylocystidia. This is a, a taxonomic feature for those taxonomists in the audience that separates cyanescence from Sinofribulosa. Another uh, san, uh, photograph of Psilocybe cyanofribulosa. And now here's Psilocybe cyanofribulosa and a species that grows in the same habitat called Psilocybe baocystis. Baocystis is another species that's native to the Northwest that we think is unique. Um, and so Policulosa and baocystis and Sylvatica are the three species that appear to be indigenous to the Northwest and nowhere, uh, nowhere else. So there's some reports now of them escaping, but I think they are escapes. Now here is the general rule. If a mushroom has purple-brown spores and bruises bluish, 
then de facto it is a psilocybin active species with three exceptions. <laughs> <laughs> but the three exceptions are strophereas, which are non-poisonous. And they're listed in my book. And they have a parallel, parallel chemical pathway for, for, for production of serotonin-like compounds, which have a bluish pigment. And we don't understand their chemistry. One of them, Stropharia ruginosa, is psychoactive. The other two are not poisonous, not psychoactive. So if a mushroom has a purple-brown spore print and it bruises bluish, both of those conditions have to apply, then you have a mushroom that is very, very high probability, 98% probability, is a psilocybin active mushroom species. Psilocybe cyanescens, psilocybe beocystis. You can see the gills are similar. They both have separate gelatinous pellicles. They both have purple brown spore prints. They bruise, both bruise bluish. Psilocybe beocystis, bruising bluish. Psilocybe beocystis when it's young. And then this has become like Mecca for the, for the mushroom hunters. This is, at the, this is the Columbia River that's flowing into the Pacific Ocean. This is at Fort Stevens State Park in uh, Oregon. It's the, exactly where the Columbia River flows into the Pacific Ocean. It's an incredibly windswept, uh, hostile environment. But the Army Corps of Engineers uh, 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 planted a dune grass to, uh, to prevent erosion. And they build these large peninsula dikes going out on either side of the Columbia River to ameliorate the, the wave pattern and the fierce tides and the breakwater that comes through there. And we found a mushroom there. It came to me several years ago. And it's an absolutely astonishing species. Um, and this park is about 20,000 acre park. And literally tens of thousands of people now go to this park. And you, where do you find these mushrooms? Well, I didn't bring the photograph that I would like to show you, but I look for Winnebago's. <laughs> you look, look for ca RV campers. Their idea of camping, and please, I'm, I, I'm a hiker. I go into the woods, I go in for five days, I go into the deep cast stage. I, I, I'm also an orienteer. You know, I go and I orienteer with a compass and, and no trails. So I'm a little bit snobbish when it comes to the people who use RVs for camping, and this is what they believe is camping. Camp spot number 66, you know, a piece of cement with a, with a table. Well, it's very interesting that this is the locus point, the central point, for finding the most potent psilocybin active mushroom species in the world, Psilocybe azurescens. So if you go to Fort Stevens State Park or adjacent parks in that area, you look for Winnebago's. They're indicator species of psilocybin mushrooms. <laughs> and this mushroom can be quite large, and it has very much, lots of rhizomorphs at the base of the stem. It's hygrophonous. It's got a separable gelatinous pellicle. It's got a purple-brown spore print. It strongly bruises, bruises bluish. It's a very, very pretty mushroom. It is prolific. It's the dominant mushroom species at Fort Stevens State Park. It's uh, very, very common. The mushrooms can become quite large, and you can see the spores from collecting the mushrooms get all over your clothes and your hands. These are really, really giant, uh, giant, giant mushrooms, and extremely potent. They have a uh, umbo in the center, which is very di different than cyanescens or other species, and they have a perfectly even margin that goes around the margin of the cap. They're called flying saucers, blue halos. There's all sorts of common names, or azures. And I call it azurescence because just you can blow on the mushrooms. They bruise bluish. I mean, they have this azure uh, tonality or color tonality about them that's very remarkable. They can become, they grow in grasses. They grow, don't grow well in wood chips alone. They will grow in wood chips. But this combination of wood chips and grass growing up through creates condensation collection uh, surfaces where the moisture comes down to the bottom of the stem of the grass and then uh, primordial form. So these mushrooms love this, this environment where there's enormous amounts of debris coming in from the ocean of driftwood. So when we're collecting these mushrooms, you hear the ocean constantly. It's all around you. And you have the sense that you're at the cusp of a, an evolutionary process. There's extremely harsh conditions, tremendous amounts of salt and salt spray all over this environment, which is mostly hostile to, uh, hostile to most species. But these mushrooms proliferate in this environment. And um, they're easily transportable. They, I mean, you can easily uh, uh, pick the mushrooms and get them to grow in your backyard. So because it's real funny, when I was there last year, I had a park ranger come up to me and goes, uh, sir, uh, we're going to ask you what, are you, what are you doing here? And I said, well, uh, I'm, I'm a nature photographer. I'm taking photographs of mushrooms. 
you know, I'm older, I'm 45, so I'm not a 20-year-old kid anymore. And uh, because my, with my friends, you know, they didn't have any collection baskets, and baskets are, are, are a telltale sign. It warns the authorities what you're doing. They fine the kids for trespassing and possession of illegal substance, $100 to $200. It's a huge profit wheel for the city of Astoria and the, and, and the small villages there. But mushroom hunting in the Northwest is part of our culture. You know, if you go to Iowa and you get busted for psilocybin mushrooms, they'll throw the book at you. But typically in Washington and in Oregon, even the law enforcement officials have histories of themselves collecting these mushrooms when they were kids. And they're not looked upon as being drugs. Now, there could be law enforcement people that will absolutely disagree with me, but the, the culture, the resident culture of the Northwest is mycophilic. We have a long, long history of collecting chanterelles and mushrooms, et cetera. So they're not looked upon as the same thing as like cocaine or something like that. And I don't believe these mushrooms are drugs. I believe these mushrooms are mushrooms, and they have a drug-like effect. But you know, that's, that's a nuance of, <laughs> nuance of confusion. So, so, so my friends wear hats, right? And they <laughs> fill their mushrooms with hats, then put, put their hats on. And um, so it was real funny because this, uh, this uh, park official, law enforcement official for the park, you know, the, I came up there and he says, well, uh, I just want to warn you, they can only collect one pound. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, you know? <laughs> so this mushroom bruises bluish to the point that it becomes black. And this is like an indio stain. It's the most potent psilocybin active mushroom species in the world, up to 2% psilocybin and psilocin. Why? Why are these mushrooms producing a crystalline substance as 2% of their net mass? It's a very good question. We thought that it has insecticidal properties. Some dimethyltryptamines are used in, in insecticide formulas. Well, obviously, that's not the case. Insects love eating these things. You know? So why is this crystalline substance being produced? You know, and you know, Terrence and others have spoken to the fact that maybe the, the crystalline substance is being produced for the purpose of engaging human consciousness to make us aware of them. So by spreading their spores, it increases the, their evolutionary uh, probability of survival. And I, I, you, know, you can argue this way back and forth, but the end of the day is, it's true. These mushrooms are surviving now because of human intervention and interest. So this is a chart um, that came out of one of my books. This is the comparison. This is Psilocybe azurescens here. Uh, this is the amount of maxima of psilocybin and psilocin and baocystin. Baocystin is similar to psilocin and psilocybin. And this is the psilocybin content of uh, Psilocybe azurescens, the psilocin, and the baocystin. And this is out of literature reports. It's almost 2%. Um, it's absolutely strong. Now, I will give you a few caveats and a few warnings. Sometimes this mushroom causes paralysis and loss of neuromuscular control to the point it's very, very frightening to some individuals. The, uh, the, uh, inf you know, we only know which mushrooms are poisonous from the unfortunate experiences of those people who have eaten them before us. That may come a shock to some of you who just come to this mushroom show, but how do we know mushrooms are poisonous? We only know if po they're poisonous if someone gets sick or dies from them or they experiment. That's the reason why we know plants are edible. You know, so this, 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 this ken of knowledge that we've developed over time, this experiential database. Um, but the, this azurescence in particular seems to have some compound in them that could be a neurotoxin. Uh, that is, that if the mushrooms are boiled, um, this neurotoxin goes away. And I really, all, I think all these mushrooms, of course you should cook all mushrooms before you eat them. The mushrooms have no nutritional benefit whatsoever, unless you cook them. I think most of you know that. Um, but with these other mushrooms, these psilocybin active species, I, I think it's really uh, highly recommended that they, they are put into uh, boiling water uh, for a few minutes uh, uh, to get rid of some of these other volatile compounds. We have no idea what this toxin is. Okay, I'm going to jump to the next slide, Carousel, if I could. Okay, another shot of psilocybe cyanescence. There's, I saw the psilocybe cyanescence out on the identification table. It's got a wavy margin. A sine wave margin, it has a separable gelatinous pellicle, the purple brown spore print, and it bruises bluish. And you can grow it quite prolifically in your backyard. It's extremely easy to grow. And how I discovered to grow these mushrooms was there is a rhododendron garden up in my area of Washington that is uh, run by a retired couple in their 70s and 80s. And they're the best psilocybin mushroom growers I've ever met. <laughs> And they have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> and they have a rhododendron garden, and they have this big sign here, dump chips here. Well, that's a good idea. The utility company is, is trimming the, power, the trees from the power lines, and they dump the chips. 
And so we started, I started making, uh, observing that they, by mulching underneath the rhododendrons and then putting cardboard on top of the mulch to, to suppress weed growth, the chips become cased with cardboard, mycelium runs underneath the chips, and then latches onto the cardboard. So I started playing around with this, and I discovered this, this little technique, which other people, by the way, also discovered. I'm not the only person that came up with this. A lot of people discovered it simultaneously. Here's philosophy, Azure Essence, and here's Dusty, my fiance, knife and cardboard. You take the base of the stem, which you trim off anyhow, you put it in the corrugated cardboard, you put the corrugated, you sandwich the corrugated cardboard, you have rhizomorphs, little strands of mycelium at the base of the stem. Very pretty mushrooms, aren't they? They're just so, so pretty. And then a week later, they start to regrow. So with no spores, nothing else, the base of the stem, it still has enough life force energy in it to continue to grow. So you wait two weeks, and you get what I call happy mycelium. <laughs> These are rhizomorphs that are going out, and they're all branching repetitively. And so the mycelium, you end up creating cardboard spawn. So you can put down the cardboard then, and they can create your own little magic mushroom garden in your backyard with no purchasing of any scientific equipment, no petri dishes, pressure cookers, or anything else, uh, just from the collection of one mushroom. And, so you can, and you can grow this very discreetly and small scale. It's, it's by definition small, small, small scale. You can't grow this out too far. Um, this is my son. He was very, very excited that dad has an expertise in this field, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nose ring, I mean, everything else. So there's going to have a whole other second generation of uh, um, psilocybin mushroom enthusiasts. Um, these were collected down at Fort Canby. And I want to show you something here. Look at the, the cloth. I mean, it's basically giving you a TLC, you know, thin, lit, thin layer chromatography signature, you know, kind of bleeding out directly into the cloth just from direct contact. Extremely potent species. Now, I want to, there's another species, the last species that I published um, is in Georgia. This is in north of Cherokee County, Georgia. And these are where these mushrooms love to grow, it's interface environments, multiple canopies. Uh, mixed in uh, plants, deciduous